Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, God is such a good God. We are here tonight in another session of Bible study. Uh, we, you know, want to share in our word um, a series, you know, of study. Um, I want to greet you, those who are tuning in now and those who will be tuning in, I want to greet you in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that it is the, his name is the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will have to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Before we proceed, I'm just going to read a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we magnify your name, we glorify your name. We thank you, God, for the privilege of being able to share in another session of Bible study. We pray, mighty God, that as the words go forth, that you, know, you will cause them to accomplish what you will. Speak to every heart, speak to every mind, speak to every spirit. We pray, God, that you know, when all is said and done, that you, know, you will receive the glory. Have it your own way. And bless us one more time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight we want to, you know, start a new series in, in, in our Bible study. We want to look at the topic, the dispensation, dispensation. And, you know, there are many different school of thought around the topic. You know, but as we get into the word of God, you know, we want to point out from scripture, you know, what the Bible says about, you know, the dispensation. And, you know, we want to see what it is that we can, you know, gain from looking at you know the dispensation right so the topic is a broad one with you know many different school of thought but under the the lord i want to use the next couple of weeks you know to look at the topic now let us go to our slides um so we want to look at the topic in a bit to you know see what we can learn to see you know, um, if there are anything that we can clear up, any misunderstanding, and we want to, you know, just be able to get into the word of God so that, you know, as individuals, you know, we can learn and we can take the word of God and apply it to our lives. So the aim of the study, you know, that, you know, we will be getting into is to see what, what it is that we can learn about the Lord as we study the topic of the dispensation. You know, we, just, we don't just want to come and to present. We don't just want to present information and, you know, to say that we, you know, have this information. But we want to see what is it that we can learn about the Lord. It will be futile for us to, you know, study such a topic without seeing what we can learn about the Lord. You know, it, we really want to get closer to him. We really want to know how we operate because when we know how we operate, and I know that we cannot pin down God, you know, we cannot time to say that God is going to operate or he's going to move this way. But the more we know about God, the more we know about, you know, how he, how he works, how he does things, amen, it will be better for us as individuals along as we walk along this Christian journey, right? So we want to see, the, the, we, we want to study with the aim to see what is it that we can learn about the Lord. And then number two, we want to see if we can clear up any misunderstanding that we have. You know, a lot of time we read scriptures and, you know, just reading the scripture by that and we come up with, you know, a, 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 a interpretation, so to speak. And, you know, sometimes there might be a misunderstanding. And, you know, sometimes it's not an all-out misunderstanding, you know, but there are just some little things that, you know, want to, we want to straighten out. And, you know, as we get in the study, you know, we'll see some of these things, you know, that, you know, will come to us, right? And the third point we want to study to help us to be better Christians. And, I mean, um, we can find the scripture, 1 Corinthians 10 and, and, and 11, right? So we want to study to be better Christians because we don't just want to get in the word and we get in the word and we talk 
a lot and we, and we, we give information and read the scriptures without getting to the point where we become better Christians, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to live a life that is pleasing and a life that is holy and a life that is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. And as we get into studying the, the, the dispensation, we want to look at some of the little things that happen within the dispensation. And as we get down, I am going to point out to us that we will try to do the study systematically so that, you know, for each dispensation, we look at the same points, you know, so see how God operates. And also to help us to be better Christians. So 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul, you know, as he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, no, these things happen then as examples and were written down as warning for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. All right. Let's, so in other words, you know, the apostle was saying that these things that occur, right? Um, yeah, these things that were recorded are for our example. And, you know, it, the, the scripture is there. The scriptures are there from Old to New Testament. And as we read, I want us to understand that, you know, when we see certain things happen, we should not go and make the same mistakes. When the Apostle Paul wrote to Corinthians, he made mention that these people murmured about certain things. And, you know, he made the point to the Corinthians that, you know, they, these things were written for examples. Their record remain as a stand, standing warning that, you know, we have great privileges. But at the same time, because we enjoy great privileges, you know, we may use them to our destruction. So these things, the apostle said, are written for our example that we should not make the same mistake. So as we look at the different dispensation, we want to look at some of the things that happen. And we want to draw from them, you know, some things that will help us to be better Christians. Let us go to the other slide. You know, some, some folks, you know, really don't, don't believe, you know, in, in, in several different, different dispensations. While on the other hand, there are some other folks, you know, that believe in the dispensation. They believe that God deals with m mankind over different administration, different period of time. I really don't want to say different period of time, and you will know wh why as we get down. But, you know, he deal with, for a lack of, you know, better term, he deal with mankind over different administration, um, over different period of time, you know. And, and, and as we get down, you are going to see how these different period of time break up. So some church folks don't believe that, you know, there are several dispensations. While on the other hand, you know, they are f f folks that believe that there are several different dispensations. In, in, and there are also some theologians that have, you know, there are different school of thought. Some will believe that there are eight dispensations. Some will go to as many as 13. And I've read where, you know, some are up in the 30s. But for this study that we will be going on, we want to look and we want to consider the seven dispensations that we can find within scripture. So do you believe that God really deal with man in different period of time or different administration, right, that is referred to as dispensation? Do you believe that God really deal with us or do you believe that there is no such thing and that there is just one time from, from God said, let there be and there was. And the, the, the evening and the morning was the first day. Do you believe that, you know, time just continue, the, the administration just continue? Or do you believe that, you know, God really deal with mankind over different, different generation, over different period of time? What do you believe? Move to the next slide. 
The apostle in the book of Ephesians 1, 10 and 11, going to ask us to find that also, um, talks about dispensation. So if you as an individual do not believe that, you know, there are different dispensations and you believe that from creation until now, it's, you know, it's just time and it's just one administration. The Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians 1, 10 and 11, he spoke about, the disp he spoke about dispensation. And he said that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. There is a principle to this, Bridging, and I want us to understand that God operates the universe by a plan. God he can, but he is an organized God, and he did not just get up and say that, you know, tomorrow this is going to happen, and the next day this is going to happen. The, 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 the Bible says that he is from everlasting to everlasting. He is from everlasting past to everlasting present. There's another scripture that says, known to God are all his works from before the foundation of the earth. So, God knew what he is doing. And he operates the universe by a plan to go further as, 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 as individuals. He said in one passage, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts to prosper you. Thoughts to give you an expected end. So God did not just get up and say tomorrow, you know, this is going to happen. He did not allow, he, 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 he does not allow things to happen. But what he does is that he operates the universe by a plan. And there's a principle to what, you know, the apostle said, that, you know, in the fullness of time, there's also another passage that says in, in Galatians, I think, 4, verses 4, it says, when the fullness of time was come. So what the apostle Paul was saying in Galatians was that when the time came, which gives us the idea that from the beginning of time, God had this in his mind. And he said, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that was under the law. So, that we might receive the adoption of son. So God does, don't get up and just operate willy-nilly and just operate, you know, without a plan. There is a plan, there is a principle that guides how God operates, and he operates the universe by a plan. Amen. Brethren, there is also an application for the scripture. God operates within an organized system, right? A dispensation, a way of life, where all individual parts function within the purpose of the system, within the economy of, the dispensi of, the, of dispensation. So God works in a succession of season to work out his purpose. A dispensation reflects God's order and God's plan. So the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 10 and 11, right, that we read earlier on, when he mentioned that, you know, it, 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 in the dispensation of time, you know, he might gather all things in one, right, in Christ. You know what the Apostle Paul was saying, that there is coming a time when this is going to happen where we'll gather everything in heaven, everything in earth, in one, in Christ. And there is coming a time when, you know, Christ will be on earth to reign. But as we get into the dispensations and as we look at them, you know, we will see what the scripture says, you know, about, you know, Christ, you know, gathering everything, God gathering everything to become one you know, in Christ. So there are seven dispensations, seven period of time, um, seven administration, seven, you know, economy, so to speak, in which God deals with mankind. Um, before we get into them, though, you know, there 
is a question there, you know, you know, that I would like to answer before we get into it. So let us go to the next slide. So why is it important to study the, the dispensation? Why is it important to, to study dispensation, right? The first reason I want to give for us to study dispensation is to rightly divide God's word, right? The Bible in 2 Timothy 2, verses 5, verse 15, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? So, the New Living Trans Translation says, Work hard so that you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and one who correctly explains the word of truth. To rightly divide, to rightly divide is compound in Greek. It's compound in Greek, right? And it simply means to dissect or to expound correctly. It is important then, brethren, that, you know, as teachers and as presenters of the gospel, that we be able to expound the word of God correctly. I want us to understand that, you know, presenting the word of God is a matter of life and death. It will affect us when we present the word of God. It will affect how people think. It, it will, the Bible says, to be a transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the renewing is going to take place by, you know, applying the word, right? And living by the word, having the word to guide us. I want us to understand, Virgin, that when the word is presented, it is a matter of life and death. It will affect how people think, it will affect what they believe, it will affect how they live their life. I want us to know that in this day and age that we are living in, there are so many things that are happening, so many people are being led astray because they are listening to teachers who have not rightly divided the word and, you know, they are being led astray. So, when we present the word brethren, it is a matter of life and death. It will affect how people think. It will affect what they believe. And in, it will affect how they live their life. Jesus said, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. When the preacher, when the teacher teaches and he rightly divides the word of God, he is bringing a spirit of truth, but he is also giving life. I want us to under, understand that clearly, Bridging. So when the word is presented to unbelievers, we are presenting life. Let us go to the other slide. When the word is presented to unbelievers, we are presenting life. Brethren, there are many who are spiritually dead and headed for a devil's hell. When the word is rightly divided, a person will hear and accept the word. They can then go on to receive the plan of salvation and reap the benefits that come with salvation. Because salvation is really deliverance from the powers and effect of sin. So when somebody hears the word, when the word is rightly divided, and the person hears and accepts, you know, they will eventually, according to the will of God, accept salvation and will reap the benefits of salvation. On the other hand, brethren, If the word can be rightly divided, 
and a person receives salvation, it means that the word can also be wrongly divided and person be deceived. And at the end of the day, find themselves in a devil's hell. Brethren, what is happening in today's church arena, and I put that in open and close quotation, right? It's no joke. There are so many doctrines of demons spewing out, and many are bound and are being led astray. But when the word of God is rightly divided, it will save the loss. Yokes will be broken. And folks will see the truth. Chains will be broken. Shackles will be loose when the word is rightly presented. And, you know, individuals will see the truth. Um, the Bible says in Romans 10, as the apostle spoke about the message of salvation, he asked, how then, and we have it up there, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Right? Romans 10, verse 4. So when the word, next slide, when the word is rightly divided, brethren. When the word is rightly divided, it will save the lost. How many of us who are in church today were, yeah, we were lost. We were born in sin and shape in iniquity. But when we hear the word, right, faith come by hearing and that by the word. And we, we move by faith. Fulfill the plan of salvation. So it is the word that was presented that saved us. When the word is rightly divided, virgin, it will take away the confusion that is set up by the adversary to deter one from accepting God. And I want to, you to understand, brethren, that there are some simple things that is set up by the adversary to deter individual from accepting salvation. How many times we hear folks say that, boy, look here, too much confusion, man. We don't know what to believe. One person is saying this, one person... Is saying that, and God is not the author of confusion. It is that the devil knows that, you know, if he can get some people to, to, to just to be confused, they will not know the path on which to travel. But when the word is rightly divided, brethren, it will take away confusion and it will remove any obstacles that, you know, is there to prevent an individual from serving the God. Thirdly, when the word is rightly divided, it will strip away the old man and renew the new, the, the, the new man. Brethren, so as individuals and as we travel this Christian pathway, there are some things that, you know, God is working on and God is doing a refining work. Bridging, and as the word is presented, and as we accept the word, and as we apply the word, bridging, one of the things that it does is to strip away the old man, bridging, and it renews the, 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 the new man. It helps us to walk in the newness of life when the word is rightly divided. When the word is rightly divided, it will save us that present the word, and it will save them that hear the presenters, and that is Bible. When the word is rightly divided, it will bring unity among the virgin. Virgin, the adversary would want the, the individual, he would want this unity in the church. He'd want folks to be walking past folks without saying, bless the Lord. He'd want folks to be walking past individuals without saying anything and he's the author of confusion and he would want this unity in the church but when the word is rightly divided bridging it will convict individuals for them to know that there is no place in the church for malice there is no place in the church for us having up our bridging in our hearts until we reach a point where we hate them 
That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible said that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So when the word is rightly divided, virgin, it will bring unity among the virgin. But similar to what we said earlier on, if the word can be rightly divided, then the word can also be wrongly divided. And when it is wrongly divided, brethren, next slide, when the word is wrongly divided, it will cause, it will cause confusion. It will bring this unity among the brethren. It will give a sense of false security. Let us start with the sense of false security. When the word is wrongly divided, it will give a sense of false security. Why? Because some folks will believe that they are saved, which in fact they are not saved because God in this dispensation of time has stipulated what it is that we need to do as individual in order to be saved. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. And then the people said unto Peter, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter said, then repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right. So God in this dispensation of time, give a stipulation, he give what it is that we should do as individual in order to be safe. Anything outside of that, you individuals are not safe. And because the world is wrongly divided, some folks feel like they are safe. They don't have the Holy Ghost, but they feel like they are safe. And that it, it, it is because the world is wrongly divided. When the word is wrongly divided, it will bring this unity among the brethren. Right? And, and in the church, it will just look like the norm and people are, 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 are not united. And there is this unity among the brethren. When the word is wrongly divided, it will cause confusion. One of the things that is happening now is that folks tend to listen to other teachers and other preachers. And because of that, you find many folks who are confused. Because when we teach holiness and we say that these are the things that you're supposed to do, they listen to some other folks, they look at what some other folks are doing, and they say that, you know, if you, you, you teach them from Bible, you know, you don't know what the other folks are, 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 are teaching. But when you see folks see other folks look away, dress a certain way, they are saying that, you know, why is it that we can't dress like that? But why don't we ask the question, why is it that they can't dress like us? So when the word is wrongly divided, Virgin, it will cause confusion and people are confused because... You know, they are being taught one thing at their own church, but when they listen to other persons online, when they, you know, visit other churches, they see other things, and, you know, they're wondering what is happening. And, you know, it is because the word is not rightly divided. I want to bring it to our understanding, brethren, that in these days that we are living in, there are some, and we're talking, still talking about confusion. There are some who, you know, will place the church in this day and age under the Sabbath. And, they, you know, they will tell you that, you know, if you don't go to church on a Saturday, then, you know, you're heading for a devil's hell, right? And there are some who do not understand how to rightly divide the word. And, and, and you know, they have congregation, but the congregation is confused because, you know, of what is being taught. You know, this is why the Bible tells us, study to show ourselves approved unto God. Because the word of God is not contradicting. When we take the time out to study scriptures, in order to rightly divide the word, we must recognize 
that line must be up on line, precept must be up on precept, here a little, there a little. That is what the Bible says. So why is it that we should study dispensation? The first point is that we study the dispensation because we want to rightly divide the word. And as we get down in the study, you know, you're going to recognize how studying the dispensation or understanding and studying the dispensations will help separating some things, help us to put them in chronological order, and then we will see the bigger picture, you know, of how, you know, God really wants us to see, you know, all that is written in the scripture, right? So I want us to understand, Virgin, that, you know, that studying the dispensation is, is one of them things that will really help us. So this is why we should study to show ourselves approved. The first point, right, when we take the time out to study, we must recognize line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So the second reason, next slide, the second reason why we should study dispensation. The second reason why we should study dispensations is to strengthen our beliefs, right? You don't want to be an individual that when a certain wind of doctrine blow, it blows you out of the church. So you want to strengthen your belief, you know, um, because as Christians, we believe. We are referred to sometimes as believers. Why? Because as Christians, we believe. We have heard the word of God, and we have believed the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, like I said earlier on, and that by the word of God. We have heard the word, we believe, and we acted upon that belief that Jesus Christ came, died, and rose from the dead, and has ascended which is really the plan of salvation. So as Christian, this is what we do. We believe, and we are referred to as believers because we believe. Now, the Bible in Hebrews 11, verse 6, right? It tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe. So the first thing, if there's anything that we do when we come to God, when we acknowledge God, is to believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So as Christians, we believe, and this is what the Bible said, the first thing that we must do is to believe. We have never seen God before, right? But just hearing the word, we believe. And, you know, there is something that we believe that we are not fully persuaded about. So what we want to do is to strengthen our belief. There are some things that we believe that we're not, you know, you, you believe it 90%, but you, you're, not, you're not fully persuaded. So there are some things pertaining to the dispensation and to scriptures and to our you know, believe about the end time, you know, that we want to clear up as we look at the dispensation. So, you know, you might not, you, you might not fully believe certain things, but it, you kind of believe and, you know, we want to strengthen those. And we also want to dispense anything that, you know, is not according to the scripture. So, a part of our belief system, Virgin, is that we hold things dear to us. Next slide. We hold things dear to us. That has not been proven. So we, ha we all have a belief system, right? And our belief system is a set of principles that help us, help to inform an individual of the world around them and help them to interpret it. So, Bridging, if... If our belief system is a Christian belief system, this is how we see the world. So we all have a belief system. Belief systems are simple in concept, 
though they can be complex. I believe system is a set of principles that helps to, like I said earlier on, to inform the individual, help you to see the world that is around you. And, you know, it, it can be as simple as believing in only using pencil for crossword puzzle. Yes, that is a belief, right? Or it can be as complex to a set of belief as it pertains to religion. It will be safe to refer to it as a worldview. So your belief system helps you to view the world. It helps you to see the world that is around you. Virgin, I put it to us that if our belief in certain aspect of scripture is warped, right? This is why we want to strengthen our belief system. It will affect how we view the whole. Let me say that another time. If we believe in aspects of scripture and the belief that we have is warped, then our entire view of the scriptures can be warped. So there are things which are a part of our belief system, like I said earlier on, which we are not fully persuaded about. And there are some things that we hold dear in our belief system that is not proven. That is what we call presuppositions. So your presuppositions that you have, but they are very hard to, to prove. You, you, you believe it, but, you know, it's very hard to, to, to prove. And, you know, but these are things that govern us. And these beliefs that we have, right, they are not just, we did not come by these beliefs overnight. Let us go to the other slide. They did not come by overnight. We hold as part of our belief system some things that comes from years of hearing. So there are some things that we hear, brethren, and we, be and we believe it. We say, yes, it sounds good. And we use that to be a part of our belief system and we use that to guide us how we operate as individuals. So we hear things and we say, yeah, it's so logical and yeah, it's so plausible. All right, I'm going to accept this thing as a part of my belief system. That do when we accept Christ, you know. So there are some things that our belief system is shaped by the things that we read. So we read some things from a child coming up, and from a child coming up, we read, we understand, and this will form a belief system. And then we process these things, form our own opinion, and then we have a belief system. But, Regina, I put it to us. If our belief in certain aspects of life and certain things are warped, then our view of the entire thing is warped. And it is a similar thing with scripture. If our view of certain aspect of scripture is warped, then our view of the entire thing can be warped. It will affect how we view the whole. It affects how we view the entire Bible. It will then affect our entire belief system. How would we feel if some of the things we hold dear to us as part of our belief system, we found them not to be true. Surely it will be disappointing, right? It will cause us to question other things that we believe. Is it true? How could I believe this, this thing for all these years? It would be like some folks who... were baptized, so to speak, in the title. And when they get the revelation of the oneness of God in Christ and put on the name of Jesus in baptism, they question themselves, how could I believe, how could I be blind all these years, all these years, not recognizing that this is the truth? 
So surely, brethren, it will cause us to question the other things that we believe. Is it true? How could I believe these things for all this year? And this is true for persons, right, that get the revelation of the oneness of Christ. So I would like us to understand, Virgin, that unless we have an accurate view of the whole of Scripture, we could easily misunderstand the parts. Likewise, our view of the parts will affect the whole, and it will in turn affect our belief system. Let's go to the other slide. So number one, we said that we should study why we should study dispensation. We should study to show ourselves approved that we will be able to rightly divide the word. Number two, we want to strengthen our belief system because there are some things when you study the dispensations, you will you know, see some things unveiled to you. You will get to see the bigger picture and then you, know, you will strengthen your belief system. So when a certain wind of doctrine blow, you know, it will not blow your way. And then thirdly, why is it important to study dispensation to clear up misunderstanding? And there are misunderstandings in, in, in areas such as the role of the law and grace in our life and sanctification, right? Like I said earlier on, there are some folks who believe that we are still under the law. And I pause here because, you know, technically... You know, as we get into studying the dispensation, we are going to see the pause in the dispensation of the law, and we are going to see that grace is not there, and we are going to see that at the end of grace, God will now turn back to his people, and his people will worship him, you know, as the law requires. So we are, we are going to see all of that, right? So, the, the, so we are going to see the, the, the role of the law, of law and grace, we are going to see sanctification, you know, misunderstanding. It is the end time and things to come, right? God's purpose and distinction between Israel and the church. And this is a major one, Bridget, because a lot of time we read the scriptures and we do not put a distinction between Israel and the church. And, you know, this is... is wrong, right? And it is extremely important that we be able to, you know, make a distinction between Israel and the church. Many believing folks have misunderstandings because they do not separate the two, right? We, next slide, we read, the, we read the same Bible, Right? We read the same Bible, but live with different interpretations. Right? But the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. The Bible says that the natural man receive not the things of the Spirit of God. For remember, you know, the scriptures are spiritual. The Bible says all scripture is given by the inspiration. What it says is God breathed upon holy men and they wrote the scriptures. So the scripture is spiritual. So when a natural man try to, to interpret, he will live with something that is not true. But look at this. When the apostle Paul got saved, he did not go to the, the, the other apostles. In the initial stage, what he did was that he went to the desert and he was in the desert for a certain time. But then after leaving the desert, he went to the apostle, the other apostles, and he confirmed with them what was revealed to him and by Jesus Christ. So, the apostles that walk with Jesus Christ had an understanding. But the apostle Paul went aside Talk to God, and the same spirit that revealed to them is the same spirit that revealed, revealed to the Apostle Paul. And he you know, went back to them and confirmed. So when the natural man, so, so it happened by the spirit virgin, and when the natural man is trying to understand, 
the things of God. Yes, God will reveal certain things, but he cannot understand the fullness. So the natural man, he said, receive it not the things of the Spirit of God, for they, they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So brethren, without the Spirit of God, it is literally impossible to understand the scriptures. I remember as a young Christian, um, I did not see a difference with water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and, and the titles. I used to say that they are, are one, but as I begin to talk to God and God begin to reveal things to me, I get an understanding. So, so that is what, what the Bible is saying, you know, that the natural man is hard for the natural man to understand. So we all read the same Bible, but we live with different interpretations. Some folks read and leave with a belief that the church will go through the tribulation period. And others read, others read, and understand that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Now, as we discuss dispensation, we are going to see all of this before us. We are going to see, you know, that the church really will leave earth before the tribulation starts. But as we, get, as, we, as we go in the studies, we will see this. So if we are going to interpret scriptures, right, uh, if we are going to exegese, right, we must be able to distinguish between Israel and the church. It is an important point when studying the Bible. It is an important observation to make that we separate the two. Other, next slide. Amen. So, if we, so there must be a distinction between Israel and the church. So let us look at Matthew 10, 5 to 6, and Matthew 28, 19 to 20. So the first one, Matthew 10, 5 to 6. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now let us look at the, the next scripture, St. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So in one passage, Jesus commands the disciples, and him say, go. He said, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. And he said, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go. And then in another passage, he commanded the same disciples, go into all the world. Which means go to the Jews, go to the Gentiles, go to everybody. Now, if we do not put a distinction between Israel and the church, we are going to have problem interpreting these two scriptures. We are going to have problem understanding them. So in the first passage, Jesus sent his disciples to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, do not go to the Gentiles. Are the Samaritans. Samaritans are Gentiles, you know. Because if you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. But Jesus said, do not go to the, Samar to the Gentiles. And he said, don't go to the Samaritans. As emphasis. That the disciples should only go to the Jews. In the second passage in the Great Commission, Jesus sent his disciple. Next slide. He sent his disciple. To teach all nations. And he said go even unto the end of the earth. This includes Jews. And it includes Gentiles. 
bridging anyone who attempts to correctly interpret the commission, this commission, which forbade the disciples to go to the Gentiles, and the commission that command the same group to go to the Gentiles without distinguishing Israel and the church will either one, give up in confusion, or two, resort to spiritualizing one of the passages. Brethren, without clearly distinguishing Israel and the church, our belief is warped. I would like us to understand that unless we have an accurate view of the entire Bible, like I said in the, in the second point, Old and New Testament, we could easily misunderstand the part. Likewise, our view of the part will affect how we view the whole. But let us look at Matthew chapter 24. Next slide. All right, next slide, cover that, yes. Yes, let us look now at Matthew chapter 24. You can find that one for us. So many folks say this passage is talking about the church. We will not read the entire thing. We'll just, you know, look at... Um, look at verse, look at a couple of verses. But as you, we hear from time to time, even in church, you know, folks use the scripture and they refer to, you know, the rapture. So many folks say the passage is talking about the church. And one of the mistakes we make as Christians when we read the Bible is to have a tendency to look at everything through the church's glasses, or through the, the eye of the church. What I mean is that we read the Bible as if it applies directly to us without regarding, without re regarding the context or the historical background. Let us come to the scripture. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the, building, the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? That is one question. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Question two. And of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Let us stop here for a minute. Right? Um, the, it, like I said, we'll have to read the entire scripture, you know, for ourselves. Right? But like I said, many folks, many folks say the passage is talking about the church. I would like us to know that the passage is making reference to Israel. The, 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 I know the Apostle Paul said that, and we, we, talk about this, we, we talk about the scripture already. The Apostle Paul said that, you know, what was written in time past was to teach us Romans 15, 4. But that does not mean that it was all written to us or about us. It means we are supposed to learn from the experiences of those who came before us. So they say, when will this happen? Right? And Jesus began to answer. In the book of Luke 19, 41 to 44, Jesus said the temple surrounding the building would be completely destroyed. That not one stone be left standing on another. 
Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse is found in Luke 21, right? He's the only one who record the detailed answer to your first question. When will this happen? A description of the Roman conquest in, of 68 to 70 AD was the, Lord, the Lord's answer. And then they asked, what will be the sign of thy coming? Obviously, they meant his second coming, right? And when we talk about the second coming, you know that the second coming really is, is in two parts. We have the rapture, but then really the second coming is when the, the, the feet of Christ will touch the earth again. And the, uh, the disciples were asking, when will this happen? When will your feet touch the earth again? Right? And they, after describing several things that, would, that was not so specific to the sign, but merely, you know, you know things that are, are around the per periphery, he gave them the first clear sign in Matthew 24, 15. He says, you know, it is the abomination of the desolation standing in the holy place. And it will mark the beginning of the great tribulation, right? The second, so, you know, Jesus Christ gave them, you know, the first thing. And he said, look at the abomination and of the desolation. And then he said, look at the great tribulation. And then after that, you can see the Lord return with the clothes and with power and great glory. They asked the third question. They said, what will be the sign of the end of the age? Right? This was kind of a complex question because, but, but, but Zechariah 14 verse 9, you know, kind of gives us an idea, an understanding of what will happen because Jesus Christ will come again and he will reign on the earth and that is when we will have the millennial kingdom being set up and that is when israel will be able to worship god truly as all you know he expect them to worship him so you know the three question was answered right in daniel daniel also 9 24 27 you know give us an answer about the seven year period and we will get in all of that and about the you know the 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 the, 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 the 70 weeks and we will talk a little bit about that but his disciples, they posed the question, not realizing that certain time had elapsed. And they were asking the question at almost about the 69th week. week. And then, as we discuss, we will get into it and we will tell you you know, what the, what, what the weeks represent and that, you know, seven years is really one week and we will do the, the maths and do all of that. But Jesus answered the question and folks who read the passage, the passage was talking about Israel. They have to go through the great tribulation. But folks take the passage and let it seem as if the church will go through the great tribulation and they make reference of the church in the passage. But really, if we do not clearly distinguish Israel and the church, we will find ourselves, you know, doing this. Amen. Bless the Lord. So the third point is, right, we, we want to Clear up some of the misunderstandings, right? And as we go through it a lot, and as we go through it, we will, you know, under God, be able to, you know, explain and to clear up certain things, right? But as we study, like I've been saying, if we do not have an accurate view of the parts, we could easily misunderstand the whole. That is why, you know, we have to study and we have to, you know, make a clear distinction between Israel and the church. All right, so next slide. So how are we going to proceed as we, you know, look at the dispensation? So we want to study the dispensation in a systematic way. What do I mean by saying a systematic way, way right? So I would like us to look at anything we look on for one dispensation, 
in a nutshell. We, look at, we will look at that for all of the other dispensation, right? So we don't want to, you know, look at certain points in one and then no, for the other one we don't. We want to look at the same thing. So we want to do it systematically. So the first thing we want to do, we want to look at the beginning of the dispensation, how the dispensation begin, you know, what did, you know, God do, what did God do at the beginning? And then know that will lead us into the command that was given. Because in the first dispensation, God said, look here, of every tree you must eat, but of this one do not eat, right? And, you know, we know what happened. But then we said the command that was given or what was expected of mankind because in the second dispensation there was not a command, a specific command that was given, but there was an expectation that man should live by his conscience. And then as we study it, we are going to realize that, you know, the ways of man are evil continuously. And so it, the, the expectation for, for man to live by the conscience just, just could not work out. Then we want to look at man's failure to obey God's command or what was expected. So now in each dispensation, you're going to find that, you know, expectation was there or a command was given. Right? And man failed to live by the command of the Lord. Um, so it happened in, 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 in um, the dispensation of innocence. God expect God gave the command, and man failed to live by the command. Then now we want to look at the mode of deliverance or the mode of salvation, right? Because in, with every dispensation, there is a mode of salvation, right? The Bible says that God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So there is always a mode of dispensation when God was about to destroy the earth by a flood. There was a mode of deliverance. When Adam and Eve sinned, there was a mode of deliverance. There was a mode of salvation. Because the righteousness of God demand judgment. But the grace of God said, look here, I am going to Provide a way, amen, oh glory to God, of salvation. So we want to look at the means of salvation. Then now we want to look at the judgment that was handed out. Because with every dispensation, there was a judgment that was handed out. And some folks believe that because God is so loving and is so merciful, he will not in this day and age. Judge those who he have made. And some folks will tell you that, look here, to all God good and to all him love us, he will not send us to a devil's hell. But there is always a judgment that is handed out. Brethren, if we miss the rapture, oh glory to God, if we miss the rapture, We are going to be judged. And if you miss the rapture, you're going to go through, if you can't manage, because if you cannot run with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horsemen? And you're going to have to go through the tribulation. Brethren, we cannot miss the rapture any at all. So with all dispensation, there was a judgment, right? From the dispensation of innocence, the flood was a form of judgment. And, you know, the, the, the changing of the languages was a, was, a, was a judgment. And as we go through, we are going to see because in this day, and we are going to see how close we are, you know, because in this day and age, you know that the language barrier is broken back down. Yes, because if... Anybody can travel anywhere without an interpreter right now. So some folks, you know, back in the days, I know that folks used to study. And, you know, they, they, they could interpret. So if somebody comes to Jamaica and they, they talk a certain language, they could hire an interpreter. No, there is no need for that. But somebody just put it on an app. And they are able bridging the language barrier is broken down. And I want us to understand that 
we are closer to the coming of God, coming of Christ, than we think. So, and then now we want to look at number six. You know, one or two take away from each dispensation. It would, it would not make sense. It would be futile for us to look, to go through the dispensation and don't try to get one or two takeaway. And this will strengthen the point that we made first, that we want to see how best, you know, we can gain from the study how it is that we will live for the Lord. Then we want to look at what is it that we can learn about the Lord. You know, because we really want to find what it is that, you know, as we go through the, description, the, the dispensation, to see what it is that we can learn of the Lord. Why? It, 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 it just would not make sense again for us to study and don't try to find or draw from the, 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 the dispensation. What is it that we can learn about the Lord? And, 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 as, and before we go in, I can tell you that you will see, you know, the grace of God in all dispensation. The Bible says, you know, in, in, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are we saved through faith. But I want you to understand that with each dispensation, as we go through it, we will see the grace of God in operation. Because the Bible says, Noah found what? Grace. In the eyes of God, and as we go through the dispensation, you're going to see, you know, God, this is just a part of his character. And, he, you know, as he deals with mankind, this is just, he, he, does, he does not operate without putting grace in front. Understanding that we are but just men, and, you know, at times we will fail. So as we go through the different dispensation, you know, these, we want to just tailor the study to here, because if not, you know, we will find ourselves getting into other things which, you know, will take a lot of time. But we want to just tailor the study and we just want to look at this so that we can understand, we can see what it is that we can learn about God. And we can see, you know, some pitfalls and we don't have to, have to do the same thing, right? They are written for our admonition, as we said earlier on, right? So what is a dispensation? Let us go to the other slide. What is a dispensation? So a dispensation is not simply a period of time. A lot of persons, um, when they define dispensation, they say it is a period of time in which God deals with mankind. And, you know, this is one of the simplest forms. But when we look at dispensation from the passage that we quoted in Ephesians 10, when the apostle, Ephesians 1, 10, when the apostle talks about the, dispen the fullness of the dispensation of time. When we get the Greek word taken from this passage, it means to manage a household. It describes ro the role of a steward, right? So a dispensation then can be considered as an order of things, a system or way of doing things. And this is why I made the emphasis, Virgin, that God has a plan. He operates the universe. He runs the universe, the world, based on a plan that he has. Right? So, a dispensation can be considered as an order of things or a system or way of doing things. God has a different way of life under Moses than he does today in the economy of grace. So, so, so back in the dispensation of law, there was a different way of doing things in the dispensation of grace. There is a different way, a different economy. So even though it is a period of time, and, and this is why I am hesitant to say a period of time in which God deals with man. It is because it, it deals with an administration and it deals with stewardship, right? But, you know, in, in a broader sense, you know, it is really over a period of time, you know, in which they... So, 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 for example, the dispensation of grace that we are in, it is 
a period of time from the outpouring of the Holy Ghost unto the rapture, right? So, but it's really an administration of stewardship of time. So there is a difference between the dispensation of, between the, between an age and a, dis, and a dispensation. An age deal with, you know, what we refer to as, um, relates to time, right? But the dispensation relates to our way of life and the economy. So Christians now live in an economy of grace and institution of belief that orients around Grace. Israel live under the economy of law. The church is under the economy of grace. History divides God work. Next slide. History divides God work and purpose towards mankind in different economy or periods of time. Each dispensation includes commands to see if man will fulfill his divine expectation. In each dispensation, man fail due to his sinfulness. So, though a dispensation is a way of life or economy, it covers a period of time, right? So, it, it, the simplest way, you know, is just to say, boy, it's really a period of time in which God deals with man. You know, but... You, you must consider the economy. You must consider, you know, <clears throat> the period, right? But as it pertains to time, you know, we live in a, a world with physical space and with uh, and, uh, and time, breadth, and length, right? However, God deals or He dwells in the realm of the spirit. The Bible in Saint. John 4, verses 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I want you to understand that though God deals with men, um, the economy, he does it over a period of time. Deals with a certain generation, he does it over a period of time. But really, God is not constrained by time, because he's a spirit, and a spirit does not govern by time. In Psalms 90, verse 4, Moses used a simple yet profound analogy in describing the timelessness of God. Right? He said, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. What is God's relationship then with time? Because you will understand then, I don't know why, why God decide to make man. But you will find that God's relationship to time is man. If there was no man, Bridget, I put it forward to us, if there was no man, there would be no time. But you might be saying that, Brother Bailey, in the beginning... When the Lord said, let there be, and there was. The Bible in the book of Genesis 1 verse 5 says, the evening and the morning was the first day, implying that there would have been time. Yes, time would have begun. Yes, I would agree with you, but let us find um, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. We can go to the next slide. There's another slide. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. So, you know, some folks would say, boy, you know, what is God's relationship with time? You know, I am telling you that the, the relationship with time is man because God is beyond time. He is from everlasting to everlasting. So, you know, I was making the point that, you know, some folks will say, boy, from, from God to let there be and the evening and the morning was the first day, right? Um... That time would have begun. Yes, I would agree with you. But let us look now at Genesis 1, um, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea 
and over the fowl of the year and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the, upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the year and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So I want us to understand, Virgin, that man now is the crowning glory of God's creation. So in other words, as we read the passage, we recognize that the day and the night, the cattle, the fish, the birds, they were all made for man, which was the crowning glory, amen, of God's creation. So, so the, the real connection that God has with time is mankind. And man is the crowning glory of God's creation. So everything was made, was made to please man, was made for man. Man should have dominion over them. Man should rule over them, right? And so the dispensation then is really the administration, the period of time in which God deals with mankind. So God is beyond time, brethren. But because of man, I don't know what it is about man. One scripture says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Right? So I don't know what it is. But virgin God is mindful of us. And the connection that God has, why he stepped out of eternity, why, why he stepped out of eternity, was mankind. Virgin, I put it to us. As we go through the next couple of weeks, looking at the, the topic, I put it to us, Virgin, that, that God really loves us as, as I really love us as mankind. Even the, the chief of sinners, God loves us. So there are seven dispensations. We're getting ready to wrap up now because we're not going to get into one of the dispensations now. So we're just really doing our introduction. And after that, and next time we come, we will now get into you know, the dispensation. So there are seven dispensations. Um, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and the millennial kingdom, right? And these are the seven dispensations that we want to, you know, consider. And in each dispensation, there are recognizable patterns of how God works with those living at that time. God gives a responsibility to people. They fail to meet God's requirement. The failure is judged. And God extends grace and hope for the future. So, Virgin, next time we get back, we will be getting now into the dispensation. Right? We'll be getting into them. We'll be looking into them one by one. And remember the things that we said that we are going to cover. We are going to look at it systematically. And we are going to... We are going to, you know, be looking at the beginning of the dispensation, looking at the, you know, what was command, the command that was given or what was expected. You know, we are going to look at man's failure and we are going to look at the mode of deliverance, which is important. Um, we are going to look at the judgment that was handed out, you know, in each dispensation or judgment that will be handed out. And, you know, we are going to look at one or two takes, uh, take away you know, from each dispensation because really we want to, you know, take away things that will help us to be better Christians. And then we want to look what, you know, what it is that we can learn about the Lord, which is extremely important, how the Lord operates, right? And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this is about us learning about God. It is about us being better Christians. And, you know, it is about at the end of the day that we make, our calling and, and election, sure. So, Virgin, God bless you tonight. 
And uh, yeah, I just want to encourage you to continue to live for God. We're not, sh we're not sure that, you know, we will have our next Bible study because the rapture can come, and I want to make it in. And I encourage you, you know, live a life that you can make it in also. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, great Jesus Christ, for this topic. Lord Jesus, we pray that as we go through, mighty God, that you will be with us. That in every session that you will be with us, whatever is said or whatever you want us to say, that Jesus, that is what will be said. We pray that as we drill down, as we dig into the dispensations, mighty God, that you'll bring forth things that you want your people to hear. Things that you want to use to guide your people. We pray, mighty God, that you know when all is said and done, that you will be glorified. We thank you, God, for what was presented tonight. And we pray, God, that when all is said and done, that you receive the glory. Have it your way as we dismiss tonight. Dismiss us with your choicest blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.